Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to Season 2 of The Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by audiobook narrator Ali Shea. Ali, thank you so much for joining me on the show. How are you today? Hi, uh, I'm great. (laughs) It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. We're so happy to have you. I keep saying we, it's just me, but we're, <laughs> but I'm happy to have you nonetheless. Um, so as is, uh, as is tradition on the show, um, I would love to know a little bit more of your background. Could you tell me, could you tell us a little more about your background and how you came into the world of audiobooks? Yeah, so um, I come from a background of theatre. I'm an actor, first and foremost, or primarily from a young age, I took acting classes and um, was involved in my community theater, and I just I just loved it. Um, I think the very first thing I ever did was in third grade. There was a I went to a Christian school, and there was a production of like Noah's Ark thing, and I was Noah's wife, and you know I was just over the moon about that. But now, if I got a role named Noah's wife, I might be a little miffed. But. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, no, I'd be I'd be grateful for the work. <laughs> um, after that, I took acting classes and I was just consumed by it. I loved the storytelling. I loved, I don't know, the community and the creation aspect of it. And um, so I just continued with that. And then eventually I went to school for it. I went to a small liberal arts college, and, Hope College, and um, got my BA in theater there. And that was a lot of fun. I feel like I learned a lot about the craft and... Um, it was, it was kind of interesting to be in a program that wasn't like, you know, a BFA or something that's just really, um, large and intensive. I feel like I got a lot of, um, varied coursework. I mean, I had to take classes on everything since it was a liberal arts college, like, you know, science, philosophy, math, all that good stuff. And I feel like that has really lent itself to audiobooks, actually. So that's that's kind of fun. So audiobooks, I freaking have always loved audiobooks since I was like really little, carkening back to the Noah's Wife days. I remember I always lis- used to listen to like I had this cassette like tape packet thing. I, I don't know what it was, but it was it was full of like stories being read aloud and like on road trips you know I wouldn't listen to music or like watch a show I would like listen to this the cd chonky thing that I got from the library that was an audiobook and as I got older I actually um I live with chronic illness and so a lot of times it's a little too sensorily like overwhelming for me to watch something and I also can't let myself fall asleep so I I want the stimulus of a story. And so as I've gotten older, audiobooks have really been, you know, my savior in that way because I'm able to listen to and get into the story and have it be read to me, but without the things that are hard. So there was a acting studio in Chicago that I had taken some voiceover and film and theater classes at that I really liked. It's called Acting Studio Chicago. And Natalie Duke, who's an audiobook narrator, taught a really basic introductory course, like basically demystifying and like getting over the thing that I was scared of, like the how do you get into this Um, and just kind of giving you really basic information about how to do it and basic performance tips and um, just about the industry and what it's like. And that I remember sitting down at my kitchen table, I during I started taking this during a month during the pandemic when I moved back to live with my parents, with my spouse, um, just so we could be around other people. Um, and I remember sitting down at their kitchen table and just being like, I can, I can do this. I think I can do this. This is, this is like, this is the thing. This is what I should be doing. Uh, 
for me, it was like, I have all this training and I have all this passion and I have all this storytelling stuff, but I'm also a director. I love to direct stuff and I love reading and I love doing literary analysis. Like I love every time I read a story, I love noticing like the little things and, oh, this person scratched their chin at this point and you know and and that means they're thinking this and I just I just love that and I I remember taking that class and just being so excited because I was like this is what I've been looking for the the theater scene as amazing as it was was so grueling for my body and dealing with this chronic illness and going to EPAs at like 6 a.m and not necessarily even guaranteed being seen being seen at 6 p.m or 7 p.m and you know, and not getting paid. Like, I got cast in my first professional production in Chicago, um, we, which was supposed to open on March 13, 2020. <laughs> uh, we all know how that ended. And I, I think I was paid, like, $75 for the whole run. So it was, it's just, like, it wasn't sustainable for me in my body, in my health, to do that. But I knew I had so much to offer. So finding audiobooks and getting started in that was... I don't know. I, I'm just where I'm supposed to be, I think. So it's almost like you have all of these passions, as you say, like reading, you know, really taking um, the, the written word seriously when you when you delve into a, a piece of content. And all, it sort of seems like it really all came together then in one role. And you kind of thought, hang on a sec, this is what I should be doing. Absolutely. And I, I mean, when I first started doing it, I was like, why did I not why did I not do this sooner? Why did I not think of this? Because this is actually, and as much as it pained me to admit it, because I've been doing, and I mean, maybe I'll probably do theater more again someday, but like there was something about professional theater that always didn't quite sit right with me. Like this is definitely not every narrator's story. I think there's a lot of people who actually consider theater like their first and biggest love and narration is like a way that they kind of like sustain that. But for me... Once I started doing audiobooks, I was like, oh, shit. Oh, boy. I think I might like this a little bit better in some <laughs> ways. Like, I think what would be really, really, really cool someday <clears throat> would be doing a multicast, like, in studio with a bunch of people. That's, yeah. That would be amazing. Like, I've done some duets, and, uh, and but I just, that that seems like that's the next level, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I was talking with um, Mark Thompson, who does the Star Wars um, audiobooks, or a lot of them anyway, and he does a lot of the audio dramas for um, Lucasfilm, um, and uh, etc. And he was saying that we like that. It's like, you know, it's almost like you were recording like a show where you're all in the same room with all the actors and things. I was just thinking that sounds the best. It does. Yeah, I mean, as much as I love audiobooks, there is that missing component of playing off other people in the moment and existing in that space and uh, just... Yeah, I, I mean, there is, okay, okay, everyone, there is something very special and magical about theater. <laughs> no. um, so I do, I do miss that. Um, but I don't know, it just seems like it was, as far as professionally goes, I knew that acting was something I wanted to pursue and something that I had the, the tools to pursue. I didn't see how it fit for me in my life. And I think audiobooks definitely does, does that for me. So Fantastic. The one thing that is unique to audiobook narration is, of course, you get to structure your own day however you like it. You can record when you want or you can work it around, your, you know, what you have to do already that day. I'd love to know how you structure your day. Are you, a, are you a believer in rigid daily structure? Do you like to take a more chilled approach? Could you tell us a little bit how you structure, structure your working day? I do get morning voice, so I typically will prep in the morning. So... I'll wake up, I'll start my day, I'll eat breakfast around 9 a.m. And then I will get to work on prep and admin, like emails, social media, um, that type of thing, around 9.30. And then um, by 10 o'clock, I'm usually prepping. Uh, so I'll prep for an hour or two in the morning. If I don't have any prep to do, I just take the morning off. That's fine. Maybe get a little bit earlier start on recording. Um, and then I will eat lunch and I will start recording at about 11.30 or noon. And then um, I, I pretty much just straight up, when I first started um, recording in my booth, I had to take m more breaks, I think, because it was kind of a little bit of a shock to my system to be like in this closet. Um, but uh, since then, I think I've, I really do just like, I take a chapter and I record a chapter and it's, you know, anywhere from 15 to 
15 minutes to half an hour long. So that's going to be like for me, half an hour to an hour in the booth because I'm about two to one. And then um, I will leave the booth, get some water, go to the bathroom, come back, do the next chapter. And I continue that way until I've got about two finished hours. Um, And typically that takes me to about 5 p.m., 5 or 6 p.m., depending on if in the middle of there I'm like, oh boy, I need a I need a longer break or I need to see the sunlight or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And then by 6 p.m. I will cook dinner and say hi to the hubby and uh, that's that's the evening. If I have more prep to do, sometimes I'll prep in the evening as well. Or if like I didn't feel up to it in the morning, instead of prepping in the morning, I'll prep in the evening. So That sounds like a pretty good day. You mentioned um, at the start there that you do admin and social media and things like that at the start of the day. Now, of course, um, TikTok is becoming incredibly popular um, for narrators to share their work and advice and anecdotes and stuff. Is um, and Obviously, you are a very frequent poster on TikTok as well. What is it about TikTok that, you know, as a platform that draws you in, um, you know, as a narrator to, to share your services and projects? Yeah, it's kind of wild. Like, I I personally, me, like, Ali Shea is not, is not actually my real name. <gasps> no, um, Ali Shea is my pseudonym and my real name is Kira Fix. Um, and I, under my real name and in my real life, I like don't post on social media like at all and never have. I mean, when I was in middle school, when fa- when I first got on Facebook and it was, like, exciting, I did. But, like, since then, not really. And I kind of just don't like it. Um, but I have a friend. Uh, his pseudo is Corvin King. And we've done some books together. And he's on TikTok. And he was like, you have to get on TikTok. Like, people would love you. And you should just come join the community. And I was like... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. That sounds awful because I'm just like, like, life, you, like you've experienced in this interview. I'm like a little like rambly and, you know, just I don't I don't really. But I, I with TikTok, it, it drew me right in like right away. And I think I mean, TikTok is di- diabolical in the way that they feed you like brain chemicals Um like with the like little red circles that pop up when people like interact with your thing. And I think part of me was like, actually, this is really cool. Like besides just the serotonin or dopamine boost or whatever it is, um, it was really cool that people like, I started doing like little things like, oh, this is why I do what I do in the booth or like started recording myself recording. And some of those videos just blew up and people really loved them. And I was like, this is actually really freaking cool that I'm just alone all day recording and I actually get to share that with people. Um, So that's the thing that I think draws me to it is that it it is such an isolating and solitary job. And as while it's amazing and I love it so much, it's like, it's lonely. So it's lonely. And, and so being able to be on social media and share that work with, with listeners, with other narrators, with authors and, kind of relating to everyone on their own uh, on their own journeys and what it's like for them like I I feel like I understand so much more about authors now that I've been on TikTok because I mean I'm follow so many of them and I'm friends with them and just seeing what they go through and I don't know it's it's just really cool so it's honestly it's the community I think it's the community that draws me in which sounds hokey and I was very dubious I was like people can't be true community on the internet and I mean no it's totally true that like it is different and your relationships are different and it's not the same as being in person. And there is a level of like, at any moment you could disappear off the face of the earth and people probably wouldn't notice, but like, (laughs) I don't know. It's, it's nice to, to share. Absolutely. I'm guessing that because you're, because you're posting, you know, from your pseudonym, does that mean it's, it's a little bit more freeing? You're sort of without the confines of, you know, people you went to school with or, you know, family members or whatever you can get to, just you know, sort of almost be yourself in a weird way in freaking theory yes but like hilariously apparently tick i mean tiktok is is really big because it pushes you to people who don't follow you like that is one of the things and i mean the algorithm has changed recently but like that's the wild thing is actually i posted kind of like not a steamy narration thing but it was like it heavily implied that that was about to happen. And it was like, ooh, like flirty. And um, 
someone comments and it's a friend of mine from high school from Michigan who's like states away. And she's like, oh, my gosh, you just popped up on my FYP. I love to see that you're doing what you love. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm not safe. Um, No, but. It's so in a way, yes, it is freeing because, you know, yeah. no, no family or whatever. But then also I repost videos on my Instagram and my mom follows me, my pseudonym on Instagram. She knows what my pseudonym is. And oh, my gosh, the other day, I I'm not sure I've ever been more mortified there. Well, I probably have. I just don't remember it. But I got a review from an author friend of mine who listened to an ALC copy of Capturing Tess, um, which is a sapphic slash um this one's a lesbian romance and she was saying that the one of the female main characters had like mommy vibes and i was like "Ooh, yeah ava's got mommy vibes and i posted that review on my instagram and like did mommy vibes mommy vibes with like the smirky face on the top and uh my mom my actual real life mother like did like clapping hand emojis in response to it and i was like (gasps) No, <laughs> no. But I mean, she knows what I do, what I do, and she's she's totally fine with it. And she's listened to a lot of my books, and I'm just like, okay, skip chapter thirteen, twenty six, and uh, thirty two. But no, she's my biggest fan, probably. It's great to have that support, isn't it? Especially in close circles, and there's nothing like it. Totally. I mean, she's I I love my mom so much. She's always been my biggest supporter and it's she was always like let me know if I ever embarrass you and I'm like mom I know I love it you don't embarrass me but she would always come to like all the plays that I was in if there would be like seven performances of a high school musical or whatever she'd go to like five or six of them instead of like one or two and you know um she always wants to know like what I'm working on and what books I have coming up and I'm like I don't know she's just she's just the best so a shout out to your mum. Yeah, shout out to Terry. <laughs> Love you, mum. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you were introduced to TikTok by Corvin King, um, which of course you're no stranger to doing uh, dual narration projects with Corvin. Yeah. Um, could you could you walk us through your your process when working with another narrator? Do you have to adapt your typical process at all? Could you give us a rundown of what that's like? Um. So, I mean, I do adapt the process. Like you have to communicate with your with your dual narration partner. I mean, but I honestly, it's actually very similar to my normal process because for my own brain and my own self, I just keep track of all this stuff anyway. And I typically prep earlier ahead than I think a lot of people do, um, depending on what's going on. But I like to do that because then it gives me plenty of time to sit with the characters. And it also doesn't mean like I'm just launching on my first impression of everything because I feel like a lot of times when we launch on our first impressions, we get locked into like archetypes or or like um, caric- caricatures, and I like to like kind of sit with it for a little bit. And I also like it because that gives the author time, author or you know publisher whoever time to get back to you with pronunciation stuff like that. And they like when you don't do it like right beforehand. So I prep a ways in advance, and plus I usually prep and then I'll take notes on all the characters and just making sure you're consistent on pronunciation and characters. So, I mean, I prep a month ahead and I get that all straightened out and then I'll talk with the male narrator and usually by that point they haven't prepped. Um, <laughs> and But we'll just kind of touch base on it and one of us will record and then send character files to the other and then we just go off of that. So it, it doesn't change my workflow too much, actually. Do you enjoy that process of working with another person? Totally. Yeah. I mean, when working with people like Corvin, it's a lot, a lot more fun because he'll, we'll kind of collab on some stuff or like I just did a book with Eric Summerer and that was, that was very fun because we hopped on a call and kind of talked over some stuff and like some of the different characters. And I mean, he was talking about like placement and stuff like that. And I, I do think about placement when I choose like where I want character voices to be. But for me, that was very interesting because that's not Typically, my primary approach is thinking about placement, but it was really cool to like hear someone else talk about the character and then talk about how it was going to come to life for them. Um, and I really, I do enjoy that. Yeah. What is it about romance as a genre that appeals to you as a narrator? It's it's kind of wild. I'd never read a romance novel before I started narrating. Um, it just didn't appeal to me. Um, 
or like from from hearing about it, I was like, eh, yeah. you know, but then I started reading them for this. I was like, ah, oh, I kind of like this. And I love the it's very emotional um, and it's very vulnerable. It's very vulnerable. Like, that's the thing that I think I love primarily about it and especially about like intimate scenes. Um I've never done erotica, but I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to it. But like the the intimate or spicy scenes that are in romance, they are, you have to be so comfortable with yourself and so comfortable with the characters and what they're going through in order to just be fully present. And you don't think about like the fact that people are going to listen. You're just there and in the moment. And it's a very raw, emotional, vulnerable thing. And I freaking love that. Like I eat that up. Um so I, I, I mean, I really enjoy that part of it. The relationship aspect of it, like being relationship focused in the romance genre. And not all not all romance novels are like primarily the main focal point is like relationship. But I, I enjoy that. I like it. It really brings to the forefront, like how people react to each other. And it's it's almost like being in like a theater production, you know, when you're like, all of the little like the like hand flexes, you know, like the classic like Miss, Mr. Darcy thing, like just yeah. seeing what happens with those characters. So I don't know. I, I like the the romance genre for that. And I also like that there is a lot of work. That is a very positive side. I'm yeah. happy to do other genres. I've done, you know, fan- under my real name, I've done some like YA fantasy and some nonfiction. And I love that. But like, it's just not as abundant of work as romance frankly so hey bring on the romance on your um on your website there are some tremendously positive reviews from listeners uh, of your recent projects <laughs> how are you with um with reviews i know narrators who do their very best to stay away i know ones who look three times a day where do you find yourself on that scale i definitely check my reviews relatively frequently um i've found them quite helpful um not only is it like nice when you get a positive one, but when you get a negative one, I just have no idea what people think of this stuff that I do for hours and hours and hours and hours every day. And I mean, I have coaching, but like a coach isn't there with you every second of every book, like they're only with you for a little bit. And so it's helpful for me to notice like, oh, okay, this person felt like, oh, like her female voices were annoying. And I'm like, huh. Very interesting. Like, and I think about the different female voices for that book and I'm like, okay, yeah, I could see that. Or like, and you got to take things with a grain of salt. But like when things come up frequently, which that hasn't come up frequently, but like it kind of, it gives you important feedback, I think. Um, But I know a lot of people would say like, no, don't listen to the reviews. And I would, I would agree with that for a lot of things, but you just have to have a very critical and discerning attitude with that like and when in doubt ask a coach about it I guess but I also enjoy when people like the books <laughs> so, <laughs> that's probably the primary reason for checking honestly I think it like depends on like how you react to them as well like you know if um, I know certain people who um, and I used to be like this myself actually is like if they had like you know if read, they could read you know 20 five star reviews and then if there was one person who said one wrong thing that would just ruin your week like you know completely and i think it depends if if it always kind of kind of depends on how you how you react to it personally <laughs> how how well you can take <laughs> take people's shade i mean totally i personally i mean obviously that one where she was like her female voices are annoying that has stuck with me <laughs> but like <laughs> i there's so many positive reviews that i'm like hey i don't and so many specific positive reviews like not not that are just like oh i loved the book but that are like i loved the narration that i'm like okay yeah so it's like the negative reviews they're tools it's like i guess coming from a theater background and having so much rejection and also constructive criticism for like ever um that's what helps you get better and it's it's not personal it's just someone else's opinion and it can be helpful. So, I mean, I guess I'm definitely not in that camp that's like the negative review, like one out of 20 will ruin me. Um, it might stick with me a little bit, but like I'm I'm quite confident with what I have to offer and um, the the storytelling and the talent that I have to give. And since I'm secure in that, then 
I don't know. It doesn't affect me as much. Yeah. But not to say that not to say that if it affects you, you're insecure. Then not 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 at all. I get you completely. Um, apologies if this is a vague question. Um, Go for but it. I wondered if you, if I, I wondered if you had any advice for those who are perhaps new to the industry, um, maybe you know doing their first or you know really early titles, um, and, and are struggling with getting their name out there and 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 are working towards you know being on like a production company's audition list or being sort of more noticed and growing their their profile as a narrator. Have you got any advice for those people of what they can do? Oh boy. I mean, it's going to take time, I think. Um and it's a gradual process. I think primarily something that I've had to remind myself is to focus on the craft, focus on the the actual art of it. If you're focused so much on getting work with production companies or rosters or something like that and you're just not getting any response, I mean, there's there's a reason for it. It's not because your work is poor. It's not, but it might be because, you know, you don't have enough books at this time or there's something that needs to be polished a little bit. Um, and the more you, you work on your craft and you make good books and you connect with great authors and you, you get more books under your belt, like the connections will come. Getting on social media is good, but like also I would say do your research and listen, take your time. Don't be worried about getting on production house rosters immediately or anything like that or working with publishers because that's probably not going to happen immediately. Make sure that when you do connect with those people or submit yourself and have those relationships that you have a quality product and a quality process and you are knowledgeable about the industry um, so that when you do connect with those people, they're impressed with you and want, want to work with you again. So when you're, when you're not narrating, when you're outside of the booth, uh, what can we often find you up to? Oh, boy. Sleeping? Um, no. <laughs> I like to hang out with my friends, play games and stuff. Um, I go through phases of being really into video games. Um, right now, I'm not in one of those phases, but I, I do like a good, a good RPG. Yeah. I don't know. I, I guess I just work a lot. <laughs> <laughs> as, we, uh, as we bring the show um, towards the end, I would love to ask you, have you any upcoming projects, anything that you're excited about in the upcoming future that we can look forward to as listeners? Why, yes, I do. In <laughs> fact, the next manuscript I'm going to get is a project with good old John York. <laughs> Yeah, that should be a, that should be uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Working with a new buddy, um, <laughs> doing a little collab, and let's see. I mean, so I have a couple of books coming up. I haven't really gotten permission to talk about them because I haven't really thought about it for under Kira Fix um, that I'm doing. I just did the first book, and I'm going to be doing books two and three next month that I'm very excited about. It, they're a little bit higher profile than a lot of the stuff that I've done, and they're like. Um, YA fantasy and they're just so fun um and then after that I'm working on some stuff with Corvin I'm doing a duet with him I'm doing Invoking the Blood by Callista Neath um and she's Callista is just I met her through TikTok and she is just such a phenomenal person and like so I don't know she's just amazing so I'm excited to work on that we're booking out a ways and I'm just excited about all of them I did want to ask you um, about uh, APAC and other events, you know, other real life events, obviously, as we're um, coming out of COVID and uh, more places are opening up and, and things are pretty much back to normal, touch wood. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask, is that something that's on your radar to go to more in live events? And, and have you have you been to any yet um, in person? Yeah, I mean, I went to Allure Audiobook Con and I met a lot of people there. It was It was so fun. I mean, it was in Chicago, so it was nice and easy for me to pop on over and that was so cool like I would love to do more stuff like that I'm so excited I am going to APAC um so I'm so excited to meet people there and I feel like I've I feel like there's so many people that I feel like I know um in the narrator community that like I'm gonna see them and I'm gonna be like oh yeah I'm just seeing you again but no I'll be actually meeting them for the first time in person but yeah I'm doing that and then there's another there's like a Windy City something um that I'm going to be doing in Chicago. Um, it's like a book signing um, and I'm doing that, or it's not a book signing, it's a conference, but I'll, anyway, I'll be there uh, through Pink Flamingo. So I'm excited for the in-person stuff like 
APAC, I am so hyped. I mean, I'm also socially awkward, so but I feel like a lot of narrators are, so yeah. I feel like I'll be in good company. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of us will share. We're like <laughs> just, just not used to being around other people, so watch out. Yeah, it was like when you sat in a booth for like four, five, six hours every single day without coming into contact. It's got to rub off somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Like, I mean, I got into narration during the pandemic, but I was like, if another pandemic happens and we're all on lockdown, like, I feel like for the people who are narrators before, they're like, oh yeah, just another day, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where would you like um, to direct our audiences to find out more about you and your projects? Where can people find you? Oh, boy. Um, you can follow me on social media. Uh, that's cool. I mean, on all my social media, there's also a link tree. So it has my website, my Audible titles and my other social media. But I think that's probably the best way to keep up to date and such. Um, yeah. And that's that's really all there is to learn about me. I feel like I did. I did post. Um, Actually, on TikTok, people were asking me about my story and where I got started. And I know I told you a little bit about that, John, on this this podcast interview, but I did a little bit, I wouldn't say more in depth, but just like a different side of the story. Um, so I did four videos on TikTok that like ended up being 12 minutes just about me and my path to audiobooks. So if you're interested in that... And I also do have a video on there that's like, so many people were like, how do I get started in audiobooks and how do I do that? And that's like the most common question that I feel like we always get asked. And so I did a video on that pointing people to different resources to get started. So yeah. So I guess social media is the the answer, which is hilarious to me, as I've said, because up to like four months ago, I was like not on social media at all. But now that's the best way to connect with me, I guess. <laughs> Well, for the listeners, all of uh, Ali's links to social media and, and, and website, etc., um, will be linked in the show notes. And I think that just about does it for this episode of the Audiobook Club. Thank you so much for tuning in. And another huge thank you to you, Ali, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. No, this was so fun. Thank you so much for having me. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify 